Well, good morning, folks. It is my pleasure to come before you today and talk about how the universe reveals the glory of God, and it really does. And there are a number of different ways in which the universe declares God's glory, and we're going to explore those uh, together today. When, when the Bible touches on astronomy, it's right. You can trust it. And when the Bible speaks about the glory of God, we're going to find that it's right. When the Bible talks about the basics of astronomy, it's right. And today we'd have to all agree that, that the Bible got it exactly right. When the Bible touches on the age of the universe, we're going to find it, it, God got it exactly right. When the Bible talks about the uniqueness of earth, we're going to find that God got it exactly right. When the, even when the Bible talks about distant starlight, that is one of the issues that I want to cover today, we're going to find that the Bible got it exactly right. When we explore the secrets of the universe, we're going to find that in all aspects, the Bible got it right. People have complained and they've said, well, Dr. Lau, the Bible's not an astronomy textbook. And I certainly agree with that because astronomy textbooks, we have to change them every few years and we learn that some of the things we believed were wrong. <laughs> no, the Bible's the Word of God. And so when it touches on astronomy, it's right and you can trust it. And so let's explore these issues uh, together today. So let's begin with the glory of God. We find that the incredible size and beauty of the universe demonstrates God's creativity and His power. There's a lot of different ways in which the universe declares God's glory. But I'm going to argue that the size and the beauty of the universe are two of those ways. We learn this from Psalm 19.1, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. And I think that the size and the, the beauty of the universe are two of the ways in which the universe declares God's glory. Now, the size of the universe is something that I've found very difficult to convey to people uh, because it's, it's just beyond our ability to comprehend, really. But uh, what we can do is at least show you visually some of these things. And this is a nice way to view the universe by zooming out by a factor of 10 every four seconds. So that little green circle that you see around the Earth, the next circle is 10 times bigger than that. The next circle is 10 times bigger than that, and so on. So we're going out faster and faster and faster. There's other little lines that you see there are the orbits of the, uh, of the other planets around the sun. Finally, the sun itself comes into view right about there. So we keep zooming out. It gives you a feel for just how big the solar system is. It's enormous. But now it's reduced within a little circle there. Where are the other stars? Where they're, they'll, they're still way in the background. You see, the universe is much bigger than just our piddly little solar system. In fact, we can still see the constellation Orion at this point. And so it's, uh, the constellations are still in view. As we continue to pan out deeper and deeper into space, finally we get to the realm of the stars. Finally we get to the realm where the stars themselves, you can see them beginning to uh, converge into the middle there. And these are the actual positions of the nearest million or so stars to the solar system. So this is all accurate. And uh, as we go out even deeper, you find the stars are collected in this large structure, which we call the Milky Way. And they used to think that was the entire universe until they realized all those other, other little things out there are other galaxies. Every little speck you see there is a galaxy. And that's, those are all in their true positions as mapped out by various uh, satellites and so on. And you can see that the galaxies come in clusters. The Virgo cluster just passed by. And then the, the Coma and the Hercules clusters are passing by. And the, the galaxies are organized in this complete tapestry of strings and void. Isn't that amazing? That's the universe, or at least as much of it as we understand at this point. Well, let's go back in to, close to home, though. The Lord was gracious enough to put a celestial body very close to the Earth. We call it the moon. And it is a wonderful object to enjoy in a small telescope. And we've now mapped out the moon in incredible detail. We've actually got a, a spacecraft orbiting the moon, taking high-resolution images of its surface. And so we can actually zoom in on very small pieces of the moon. In fact, we can actually see the area where the astronauts landed on the moon. Want to see that? There it is. That's the bottom of the uh, spacecraft. Remember when they landed on the moon, the top portion, they, they, they left the legs to save fuel. And so we've left a little bit of junk on the, on the moon there. We just, we pollute wherever we go. But um, anyway, in fact, if you look very carefully in this image, you can see this, this sort of that dark line going from the spacecraft over to that crater. Those are the footprints of the astronauts as they walked away from the spacecraft. So 40-year-old footprints, how about that? They're not going anywhere. There's no weather on the moon. It's exposed to pretty much vacuum. So pretty amazing, isn't that? The detail with which we can see things today, I find that astonishing. And, and by the way, I have to add, for those of you that, that think that we never landed on the moon, it's just a conspiracy, because <laughs> you saw a special on Fox. <laughs> it's all Photoshop. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the scale of the cosmos is just as amazing as its beauty. 
The moon is a wonderful object to enjoy if you have a small telescope or even binoculars. In fact, I've just written a book called The Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky that shows you how to maximally enjoy the night sky, uh, how to enjoy things like the moon. If you're interested in buying a telescope, it'll tell you how to get one and so on. The moon is a lot of fun, especially when it's in its first quarter phase, as you see it here, where it's half illuminated on its, on its right side. Uh, that, that shows those craters, and they just look beautiful, and they, it really has a three-dimensional appearance to it when it's in first quarter phase. When it's full, it just looks flat as a dime, but when it's, when it's in that first quarter, you can see the spherical nature to it because of the way the light casts on the shadows, or on the, on the craters, casting their shadows and so on. The moon is about the size of the United States, and that just gives you a feel for how big it is. As we go out a little deeper, you find, well, there it is compared to the Earth, and the Earth is a beautiful gem as seen from space. It's the one planet I've never seen in a telescope. And, uh, <laughs> oh well. But anyway, it's we now have pictures of it from space, and I'm, I'm anxious to hear what uh, Colonel Williams will say about that later. But uh, in any case, this is Saturn at its true scale compared to the Earth. Now Saturn in a telescope, oh, it's marvelous, just marvelous. In fact, one of the things that uh, I love to do is people uh, are looking at it through a telescope for the first time, and they see Saturn, usually they say, wow. And I love that reaction. I just love seeing that. But, uh, and Saturn just looks like this tiny little gem in a small telescope. But in fact, it's, it's about nine Earths across. It's huge. And the rings go out even further, of course. But it looks amazing in a small telescope, like this tiny little gem. Astronomy is really a lesson in perspective, isn't it? Certainly. And that tells us something about the mind of God. We have the sun, for example. The sun is a, basically a stable hydrogen bomb providing... Uh, more power in one second than a billion cities use in a year. That's just, it's an incredible source of energy. And of course, it's uh, 100 times the size of the Earth in diameter. Amazing. The sun is a typical star. It's a, what we call a main sequence star. That's sort of the smallest class of star. There are some that are, that are smaller that are also main sequence, but they're less, um, they're not as warm. And so those are called the red dwarf stars. They're, they're a little bit cooler in temperature and they're not as bright as the sun. They're very, very common but we tend not to see them very much because they're not very bright. They don't stand out. Some of the brighter stars we see in our night sky are actually quite a bit bigger than the sun, like these blue supergiant stars. Mintaka, this is in the belt of Orion, and it's a beautiful blue supergiant, really a very pretty star. And you can see it's quite a bit bigger than the sun. So again, we're seeing the scale on the universe and how amazing that really is. There are stars even bigger than Mintaka. For example, Canopus, which is a white supergiant, I had never seen uh, Canopus before moving to Texas because you can't really see it very well from Kentucky. It's too far south. And so I got to see that uh, upon moving here. Canopus is a white supergiant. I had to put that in because white supergiants really don't fit very well into the secular scheme of things. They really shouldn't exist if you're a secularist. And so, but uh, God apparently had other plans because they do exist. They're rare, but they do exist. But there are stars even larger than Canopus. For example, Antares, which is a red supergiant. These are some of the largest stars that we know of. And uh, you can see it's, it's, you can't even hardly see the sun at that point. It really gives you a lesson in perspective, doesn't it? And Atari's is just one star of billions. We find that stars often come in clusters, like the M80 globular star cluster. These, these globular star clusters orbit just outside our galaxy. They're beautiful, and you can see these in a small telescope. It doesn't take a world-class observatory. You get a small telescope if you know where to look. And uh, again, I've got a book that has star charts that'll show you how to find these things. It's not hard. It's just a fun way to enjoy the glory of God, really. As we go out into, even deeper into space, we find things called nebulae. That's the plural form. And nebula is the singular. Nebula is a, it, it's Latin for cloud. And that's kind of what they look like. They're a cloud, but not a cloud of water vapor like in Earth's atmosphere. They're a cloud of hydrogen and helium gas. Those are the two lightest elements. Those are what stars are made of. But whereas stars are compact in a little sphere, a nebula is spread out over a vast region of space. And if there are stars nearby, they'll cause it to heat up and glow. And you get the most beautiful and vivid colors from these nebulae. They're stunning. And sometimes you'll have a star cluster in them as well. And so you can see the little, the little Hodge star cluster there in the, lower, in the lower right. And they're just absolutely beautiful. Uh, this nebula is enormous. It's, it's many times the size of the solar system. But some, some nebulae are relatively small. And these are called planetary nebulae. A planetary nebula is where you have a single star that's ejecting gas, and so it has this sort of bubble surrounding it, and it usually has a two-lobe or two-pole structure. They call that a bipolar planetary nebula, and you can see it there. It's beautiful, and it's dynamic artwork of God because you see it changes as the gas continues to flow out century after century. So it's beautiful artwork of God. God paints beautiful art, and he does it on an enormous canvas. 
That's the way I like to think about it. All kinds of planetary nebula out there. They're all beautiful. Uh, some of them have that bipolar structure. Some of them are circular. And we don't know if they're genuinely circular. We don't know if they're like a sphere or maybe they're bipolar too and we're looking right down the barrel. We don't really know because we can't get any other angle on it. We're here in our solar system and we really can't leave the solar system. We've only had four spacecraft that have left the solar system and they're just barely. We just don't have that kind of ability at this point. Uh, one of my favorites is the Ring Nebula. And I like this one because it was one of the first that I learned how to find. You can actually see this in a small telescope in the summer evening sky. And again, I've, I now have a book. I used to tell people, eventually I'm going to write a book showing you how to find this. Well, I did it. I finally did it. So <laughs> the Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky will show you how to find this nebula. It's easy because it's, it's, it's directly in between two stars. It's like God really wanted us to find this one. And, uh, and so he put these nice guide stars next to it. But it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's just stunningly beautiful. And it, it's, it's so weird, too. When you have a small telescope, you see most places you point it just randomly. You see stars and stars and stars and stars. And they're beautiful, but they're just stars. There's this one little magic spot where you will see a little glowing smoke ring. And it is so weird to see the, because you can't really see the color in the telescope because you're using the rod system in your eyes. It looks like a gray smoke ring. And you're expecting it to expand like the smoke that you've seen, smoke rings that you've seen on Earth. And it just hovers there. It is expanding. It's just so big. It's, it takes, you know, hundreds of years for it to make any difference at all. A little cosmic Cheerio suspended there on nothing. <laughs> really strange. Beautiful. All of these things that we've seen, all of these nebulae and star clusters and planets and so on, solar systems, are in a relatively small region of what we call a galaxy. A galaxy is a collection of 100 billion or more stars, like you see here in the Whirlpool Galaxy. And this, again, is another one that you can see in a small telescope. It's hard to see that spiral structure unless you get away to really dark skies, but I have seen it. I've seen it from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in fact, where I had a, oh, it was just beautiful to see this in a telescope. Really stunning. And there are other galaxies out there we now know. Astronomers used to think that maybe these, they, they saw these galaxies in, in telescopes, but they thought maybe they were solar systems forming. See how, how evolutionary notions have negatively influenced science? If they'd stuck with that, they would never have found out the true explanation, which is that these are actually collections of hundreds of billions of stars, not it forming. They're fully formed. They're fully designed. And you can see that there are all kinds of galaxies, galaxies of tremendous beauty. There are galaxies of tremendous ugliness. There are galaxies with large, mysterious arrows next to them. <laughs> a friend of mine used to say that. He says, we still don't know what causes that either. There are galaxies that have rings of stars surrounding them. There are galaxies that look for all the world like flying saucers. That's a real galaxy, the Sombrero Galaxy, they call that. And you can see why. It's got that dark dust lane uh, surrounding it at its equator. Isn't that amazing? And you can see that in a small telescope. Uh, in fact, this is about the time of year you'd want to see it. And it's, it's not that hard. You can even see that dust lane. You can see galaxies in the process of collision. People say, well, is that a problem, having galaxies collide like that? Not for us. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, even if our galaxy were to collide with another, the, the stars just would all pass by each other because the distance between the stars is enormous compared to the size of the stars. The chances of any two colliding are remote. They just all pass right through each other, you know. Beautiful sort of dance. We find that galaxies come in clusters. There's an enormous cluster of galaxies. As we go out even deeper into space, we find that we see galaxy upon galaxy upon galaxy. All those little specks you see, those little faint little tiny specks, those are galaxies at distances beyond imagination. Those are not stars. Those are galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars each. See, friends, it's, it's easier to believe, you know, that the universe is just chance if you don't know much about it. If you don't realize how amazing it is. How, just think of the power involved in all of this. I mean, our sun, one really kind of meager star producing more energy in a second than a billion cities use in a year. Now imagine the combined light of 100 billion stars, but that's just one galaxy. And here we have a sample of thousands of galaxies. We, we estimate there might be 100 billion galaxies in the universe or more. That's a lot of power. Spoken into existence by the word of God. That's power. That's not, chance. That's not a random chance thing. That, that requires an incredible power source. It makes sense in light of what the Bible teaches us about the biblical God. It really does. And if you think about it, all of this, according to Scripture, was made in six days. Most of this was made in one day, wasn't it? Day four. God spends five days working the earth, making it right for life. He takes one day, day four, and makes everything else. Isn't that interesting? And I love the way the Bible describes the creation 
of all these hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars each. It's summed up in this little phrase, he made the stars also. <laughs> As if it was just so easy for God to make all that, because it, it was, he's God. But it's almost like, you know what would go really good with an earth? A universe. Let's throw that in too. <laughs> Let's put in 100 billion galaxies. That'll really impress the creatures that are made in my image. And that's what it should do. It really should do that. Well, aside from the glory of God, I think, we could, I think we can see the universe clearly declares God's glory. But we also find that the Bible is right when it talks about the basics of astronomy. Things that we take for granted today. But in the past, not everyone agreed. There was a time when people thought the Bible was wrong about some of these issues that I'm going to bring up. For example, you know, the Bible talks about the spherical nature of the earth. In Isaiah 40:22, the circle of the earth. In Job 26:10, it says that God inscribes a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. And that only makes sense in a, on a spherical world. Not just a circular one, but a spherical world. That's the only way you can make sense. The Isaiah passage, you might think, well, maybe just a circle. But with the Job passage, there's no doubt. It's referring to a spherical planet. And that might have been hard to believe when those verses were written because they were written in a time when people predominantly thought the world was, was flat. Maybe a flat disk, but nonetheless flat. In fact, if you consult most secular textbooks, they'll credit Pythagoras with being the first to come up with the idea that the earth might be round. And they usually credit Aristotle with being the first to prove that that is so. But uh, Pythagoras is 500s BC, Aristotle's 300s BC. The Bible got it right a lot earlier than that. Isaiah is 700 BC. Job, we think, is around 2000 BC, the, the earliest book of the Bible to be completed anyway. Moses hadn't yet uh, written Genesis at that point, although the, some previous documents may have existed. The Bible got it right before the experts of the day, as far as I can tell. By the way, I have to add something here, too. So, some people are under this impression that Columbus was the first to think that the earth was round and that he was trying to prove that. That is a myth. People already knew the world was round at the time of Columbus. He just thought it'd be faster to go that way. I just have to dispel that because you hear that from time to time. The Bible teaches that the earth is suspended in space. In Job 26, 7, it says that God hangs the earth upon nothing. Wonderful poetic description of the nature of gravity, isn't it? And of course, that would have been hard to believe at the time that it was written. Again, Job around 2000 BC. But at, even as, as late as 800, 900 BC, the Greek experts thought that the earth was a flat disk and floated in water. And doesn't that make more sense? Could things float in water? We've seen that. But to hang something upon nothing? What nonsense is that? Might have been hard to believe. But we know that the Bible got it exactly right. We have pictures of the earth from space today, and it literally hangs upon nothing. It's a great description of it. The Bible got it just right. The Bible, I believe, teaches about the expansion of the universe. It says that God stretches out the heavens as a curtain spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. And I think that's describing the expansion of the universe, either in the past or perhaps even continuing into the present. And that would have been really hard to believe when it was written because the secular philosophy at the time was that the, the universe is static and eternal. And that view persisted up even into the 1500s, the idea that the universe is just static and eternal. It wasn't really until the 1920s that the secular astronomers from observations of galaxies, says, you know what? The universe seems to be expanding. Well, how about that? The Bible got it exactly right. And so that's what we call the Hubble law, the idea that the universe appears to be all stretching out. Now, I have to add something here, too, because some people say, well, doesn't that mean there was a big bang, right? Because you run it backwards. It mean, doesn't that mean the universe exploded into existence 13 billion years ago since it's expanding? But that's not the case, right? I mean, some of you are expanding a little bit. That doesn't mean you exploded into existence billions of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> just means you're a little bigger than you used to be. And so, this, so it is with the universe. Apparently the universe is a little bigger today than it was when God first created it. But it doesn't mean that it was ever a point or that, you know, God could have created it with size and then stretched it out a little bit. And people said, oh, but the Big Bang predicted this expansion. And so it at, le at least counts as evidence in favor of the Big Bang. But it doesn't. Because the expansion was discovered in the 1920s. The Big Bang, the idea that the universe came from a point was invented in 1931 as an explanation, a secular explanation for this expansion. So it's not something the Big Bang predicted. The Big Bang came later. It's post-diction. That's different. Conservation of energy and mass. Something This is a little more abstract, but I do believe the Bible teaches that the amount of stuff in the universe is constant. And that's what we call the conservation of energy or the conservation of mass. Einstein tells us energy and mass are basically the same thing measured in two different ways. We'd expect this from Scripture. Because all things were made by him, the Bible says, and God ended his work of creation on the seventh day, Genesis 2.2. Uh, 2. 
And so we'd expect no new material would come into existence because either it would mean that God's still creating, which cannot be because he ended his work, or it would mean that, uh, that um, something comes into existence apart from God, which cannot be because all things were made by him. And these are generalization statements. I, of course, I do allow for God to do creative miracles. There's no problem there. But in general, he's not creating today. Creation was finished uh, at, by the seventh day. So no new material comes into existence. And we expect material would continue to exist because God upholds all things by the word of his power. And in him or by him, all things consist or hold together. So God maintains that which he has created. How about that? And those two principles together are the conservation of energy and mass. And again, usually James Joule, I think, is credited with the discovery of conservation of energy. At least he's the earliest that I could find. But he's 1800s. The Bible speaks of these principles thousands of years earlier. Isn't that interesting? The Bible talks about countless numbers of stars. It, it describes Abraham's descendants as the stars of heaven, as the sandwiches upon the seashore, and a, a metaphor for an uncountable, humanly uncountable number. Of course, God counts the number of stars and calls them all by name, but it's humanly uncountable. And that might have been hard to believe when the passage was written, because you can see a few thousand stars with the naked eye. Countable. Big number, but countable. Until we, until we invented telescopes and we realized, oh, that Milky Way that looks like that just faint band, that's actually hundreds of billions of stars. You couldn't possibly count that. It's a wonderful description. Absolutely wonderful. Now, here's my question. Have we learned the lesson of history? In the past, whenever the experts of the day have disagreed with the Bible, the Bible has always turned out to be right because it's the Word of God. It's not surprising. What about today? Well, some of us have learned a lesson of history, but some people haven't. Because you'll find people today that say, oh, yes, but today we now know the Bible got this wrong and that wrong and the other. And if they state that way, they haven't learned the lesson of history. They haven't learned that God is always right on every subject on which he touches. And one of the areas today that in particular comes to mind is the age of the universe. Because that's one where they say, oh, the Bible certainly got it wrong here. But I want to show you that when you actually look at the evidence, it's consistent with a young universe a universe that's the age that the Bible indicates. There are many lines of evidence that confirm the universe is thousands of years old, not 13.7 billion or whatever the big bangers require. Uh, scripture teaches a young universe. The Bible makes it very clear God created in six days. In fact, the, most of the objects we look at in the universe, the luminous objects, certainly were created on day four. The Bible makes that clear. He made the stars on that day. By the way, the Hebrew word for stars would include things like planets as well. So the luminous objects were made on the...